Heather Ressler. I come from a background of early intervention, so working with kids with all kinds of disabilities and delays, um, but my degree is actually in deaf education, and then I went through um, training to do the ABA, and so I've been running this program now for almost eight years. So. My name is Kim, and my background is in special education. I am a certified special ed teacher. I've worked in a private school setting, public school setting, and then I've also worked with um, middle school and high school and adult individuals in a job type setting. Um, and now for three years I've been um, in this preschool program that's based on ABA. And I'm also um, a registered behavior tech. And you've worked in the private? Yes. So with you, you went through kind of like a training program in general for like would that be considered for like ABA or just? Yes, it was um, through two different places when I found out I was going to do this and one of them was um, in another part of the state and it is, I'm not going to say any names, but it was a, it's a pretty strict ABA program and so actually when I was first doing my training there I wasn't sure that I really bought into this and that I, because it, I just felt like what I was seeing was um, kind of a Pavlov's dog kind of situation where the kids learned if I do this I get a cookie or a toy or whatever else but I don't they never really generalized and figured out why they were doing that and the skills didn't really build on each other so at first I was like oh what have I kind of got myself into but then I did the second part of my training somewhere else that um where the program that I actually work for now and it's um it was kind of an aha moment because I saw that if, if it's done in different ways, I don't want to say the correct way, or because it all depends on the kiddo and everything else. But um, that the way our program does it is that each skill builds on the others, and then we have a generalization piece of all these skills, so that um, these kiddos learn to do it um, not just this way to get this. They learn um, that it carries over into this situation and with this person, and then this with other kids and with other adults so that they really realize they're not just learning to copy this, they're learning those imitation skills as a whole. Um, and I liked that our background, our, or our program um, isn't a strict ABA, we're a discrete trial um, program versus there's a couple other ABA programs, there's pivotal response and verbal behavior and early start Denver, which I don't know much about those because that's not ours. Um, but then I saw that, and then I saw the piece of ours, too, that had them with typical kiddos to work on that socialization piece. Because as we know, these kiddos, um, their main things are language and social deficits. So we wanted to make sure that they were learning those skills. So, And then we also have the um, home environment yes. part to that, too. So generalize it into the home. Um, and Heather will go into the home and show the parents what we've done here, how they can incorporate it into the home. And again, that's just um, allowing the kids the chance to practice their skills here. They practice them in the class with the typical peers. They can practice them at home. And then the parents can carry it out into everyday life. And that is one thing that you're going to see at our program that's not going to be with all the other places that do ABA because they're private, they're through insurance. It's more of a medical model, whereas ours is part of kind of early intervention and then moving on. Um, the kiddos that are with us, are we get them around the age of two and then I transition them out of pre-K and our goal is that they transition into a typical classroom or a regular classroom maybe with support but that's our goal is for them to be with their peers because that's where they need to be and that's where they'll learn best so but yeah obviously you're not going to see that home visit part with with all the other ones but that helps because um, as lots of families know having a child on the spectrum is it's different than their other kiddos and it can be challenging and things just everyday things like eating and sleeping and potty training and being able to go to Walmart or go out to eat dinner those are the kinds of things I can help them with so um, we our program is um, state funded because it's okay. um, they start out when they're with me and they're still in the early intervention program and so they're paid through through that and then when they normally would leave early intervention at age three and they stay with me till pre-K, then um, we have a number of actual 
funding sites, which kind of change from year to year. Um, we're working on some grants right now. We get still get some state dollars. Um, OU has a piece of it, um, so they have, and so it's all, it just kind of depends. We're kind of working on that right now. Each yeah. budget year is a little Whereas bit different. Whereas in the private sector, it would be more through insurance, would be where, or private, or private pay, pay that the family's actually paying for it. And we're actually, we're seeing now that more insurances are covering it. Um, a lot of insurance companies and things didn't, were wanting to steer clear of covering ABA because when you look at it, it says 40 hours a week. Well, I mean, most insurance are gonna pay for somebody to see a therapist that can charge however much, you know, 40 hours a week. But under that 40 hours, most of them believe that that's also being carried. Some of that's at home and some of it's at school and some of it's, you know, obviously yeah. nobody has time to sit down and take their kid to 40 hours a week of therapy. There's just no way. So. But so we're seeing more insurances are covering it, and now our state Medicaid program is finally coming through and, and covering that for families. And there are more places in town to do it. We didn't have very many, you know, it has to be a BCBA, a behavior um, certified board and um, person that does this. So we didn't have very many of them here because it wasn't covered. Um, now we're seeing we have um, one, two, at least three, almost four places that do it privately now here. So. And they're probably all a di little different. I mean, I haven't seen them all. When my, if my kids go, uh, the kiddos that are in my class go to some of the other places and get private therapy, I usually try to go with them along the way just to make sure we're kind of, you know, on the same page as far as therapy. But so I can't really talk about how each of them do. But my guess is they're all just a little bit different each. So. To become a registered behavior tech, there's a 40-hour online course. There's also having supervision under a board-certified behavior analyst, um, and so they'll do some like on-the-job training, um, and they'll kind of check off that you can do certain skills, and then there's also an assessment piece to it, and so going in and actually taking an assessment, um, and then always still have to be certified by a behavior analyst just to make sure that while you're practicing, you're following um, all the guidelines that they set forth. Um, so yeah, I did that about a year ago. Yeah. And, and you don't necessarily have to have any background to do that, do you? Um, to be a behavior tech, you, I, I think just a high school degree, yeah. But like I said, so I've done um, special ed, <laughs> and the thing I wanted to say about that in regards to ABA is previously being in a classroom with, you know, 12 students, um, and having goals for each of the students, but sometimes those goals are, are set by the school district. And it's, you know, in my opinion, a lot of them were just higher level things. Um, I had third through fifth grade kids with autism and I had to teach them the three branches of the government. But there were, you know, we weren't communicating and we weren't um, having certain social skills, certain building blocks that we really needed to work on to build up to be able to know or even care about this other information. So that was frustrating to me. Um, and then just the manpower, um, a lot of them needed one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of them needed all these skills broken down into little steps. And so um, with, when I was in that environment, it was just a little overwhelming. Um, all the things you want to do but maybe aren't able to do. Um, and during that time I had gone and toured another branch of our program and I just uh, fell in love with it and I saw that it worked and I saw progress, um, things where before I could have a kid in my class and we wouldn't see a lot of progress. And so that's what I love is just the systematic approach of this um, program based on ABA and how it really breaks like the foundational blocks. We're working on imitation, we're working on attending everything that they're going to need um, in a school setting um, prior to them actually going to the school setting. And having worked with middle school and high school and adults, there's still some individuals that don't have these basic skills that we're teaching now. So I just see the power in if we can teach it now, um, just helping with independence later in life. Well, with our program, it's going to be, like I said, they're going to come into us differently than right. they come into the private sector. Most of ours, are, all of ours have been in early intervention already for a little bit of time, whether that be a few months or even up to a year or two. Um, so they already have goals set. Um, they're pretty broad, and with early intervention, they're kind of family goals versus just you know, like a difference between like a, a goal for early intervention and goal for school would be like, oh, uh, we want them to request 
be able to request what they want to eat a few times a day. And in school, it'd be like, we'll say the in sound and medial position. I mean, it's night and day. But there's our educational goals and our more family goals. And that's the different per- between Part B and Part C of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, so when they come to me, when they, they're put on the list, and it's not a waiting list per se, it's just kids that have either already gotten a diagnosis of ASD or have failed the MCHAT and then the follow-up to the MCHAT, the STAT, are put on a list with early intervention. And then as I have openings, I go and pull from that list and I just pull, I start with the youngest one because we want them with us as long as possible. So um, what I generally do is I go out with whoever the therapist that's currently seeing them, kind of explain our program, the background of it, what's going to be happening. They usually then will come up and tour and and visit and, and, visit and kind of observe and see and stuff and then I will also go back to the home again before they come and kind of get an idea of what some of their favorite things are, what are some of their challenges, what are some of their strengths, finding out all that stuff so that we're kind of ready for them when they come. Now the goals, we'll still have goals per se, like if they want them to talk or they want them to interact with other kids or they want them, but then our programs are kind of set already. You know, we start out with some of those basic building block skills. We're going to start out with basic imitation program, um, a pointing to communicate program just so that they can have some power and some way to communicate um, if they don't have any language yet, Um, a joint attention which is basically paying attention, learning to look to people as resources and look at you and and do those kinds of things Um, and follow just you know, responding fo- to name. Responding to name. To look um, when you say their name. Yeah, and even like, you know, following a gaze or following a point, some of those kinds of How things. How to play with toys appropriately. Yeah, we start out with play programs because a lot of times they'll come in and they either want to, mm-hmm. you know, just spin things or throw things or they just don't know because they don't, they don't learn by watching other kids like other kiddos do. Um, and so we kind of have to start and we start with basic toys that have a, a start and end and they're a little cut and dry and so... Um, we have a developmental sequence um, for our programs, so we have a lot of programs. I don't know how many, but basically it'll, the developmental sequence will say when they first start, here's where we start. They've passed this one, let's move on to this one. They've passed that one, let's move on to this one. So continually and some building it, on the skills. And some of it may just be learning to kind of sit and attend and those kinds of things first mm-hmm. and, and some of those basic skills. Being able to give up a reinforcer, you know, we use reinforcers to help you know, um, make sure those behaviors and those learning things happen again. Well, then once I get one of those things, I don't always want to give it up. So, you know, the learning on that, some of those kind of basic building blocks. So. And then we also do beginning assessments and mm-hmm. then exit assessments mm-hmm. to kind of show their progress. Because when we first started out, we were a research program and they were kind of having two kids that were about the same age, same sex, um, and they would have one staying just in early intervention and one coming here, and then they were doing a vows and kind of checking to see the difference and stuff so it was interesting to see you know but early intervention they're getting maybe one day a week um, for an hour whereas these kiddos you know are getting five days a week three hours a day I mean it's not all sitting and doing you know table work ABA I mean we can build that in we build it they just do a regular preschool skip so they're also doing it during circle time and outside time and snack time and art play time and art and that kind of thing so Yeah, I I liked what you had here. Basically, um, if there are challenging behaviors, we're wanting to teach appropriate replacement behaviors. Mm -hmm. And we do that with positive reinforcement. Um, And so, for example, the child wants something and their behavior right now is to kick and scream on the floor. Well, then we're going to teach them, I can ask for that. Um, and then once they're able to ask for that by pointing or saying the word, you know, and we're going to use reinforcement to do that. Um, we try to keep everything very positive and pair it with praise, but we might also use something that they find reinforcing an edible or a toy that they like. Um, and so through, I would say through our positive reinforcement, that's how we are teaching and shaping compliance. Um, so it's not what you would think of like, you have to sit down and yeah. listen to me and, and do this. and Because we're not going to strap them in the chair to uh-huh. teach them to learn to stay. They're, they're there. And pretty much they all, once they kind of sit and realize this is, um, they actually end up wanting to come back and do the work. I mean, when mm-hmm. it's free play time, they'll want to come back and they'll try to be coming back to the table because they like that time because it's very structured. They know what to expect. They know that's where their favorite things are. Um, so they kind of 
fun to do that. There's some of our kids though, but we're not going to make them sit. We, you know, they have three 30 minute work sessions and these are little, these are little guys, little kids that have never probably sat still that long ever. <laughs> you know, a lot of times they don't even sit and eat meals with their families or anything like that. They're usually grazers and running and doing things like that. So, um, there's one of ours now. As long as he's still working, he can stand, he can move around a little mm -hmm. bit. You know, we're not super so we're strict about basically that. basically shaping compliance by having all their favorite things and making it a fun environment. And But then I, we're going to back off on that because uh -huh. obviously when you get into real world, you don't always have a Skittle or whatever else. Yeah. So we always pair it with that social praise. And so and, and we've got ones now that now are fine working just for that part. A high five, a good job, uh -huh. a, a whatever. But so. I kind of equate it to all of us. Why do we go to work? Why do we do what we do? So that we can, you know, we get paid, we get paid <laughs> and we, we can get the things we want by getting paid. And so even with our kids, you know, why would you want me to do this? So we kind of have to have something to start out to show them, do this, you get this, first this, then that. Um, but in a fun way and in a way that's going to motivate them to want to do the maybe more appropriate behaviors. And to circle back, uh, you all mentioned um, teaching them appropriately. Uh, so how does uh, that work as in, is that just when they're interacting with others or is that just like how you should be playing with the toy, like how it's designed to be played with or like how does that work? Not even necessarily how it's designed because you know we want them to be still be creative and things but a lot of our kids don't um, and it can be any of those times um, but in, like if it, there's a ball toy where it goes down that uh, you know one of ours he started all I needed to do was throw the toy. <laughs> And it's not so much that that's wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, we throw balls, that's what you do. But then there's also this cool toy, and look, when you put it in here, it goes down here and makes a funny sound. We just want them to know what all. And then we actually, with toys, we, you know, there's obviously some toys you put them in, you take them out, there's not a whole lot of, like the shape sort <laughs> and things like that. But then as we move up into more pretend play and those kinds of skills, like playing with like the little people farm or the house, I mean, there's a million, there's no right or wrong necessarily. There's a million things you can do with it. Um, and then getting up into, we're playing in the play kitchen and cooking and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's not that we're saying this is how you have to play with this toy. I mean, after the ones that pretty much yeah. that's it. You put the shapes in, you take but shapes we, out. But. but we've seen the progression of, you know, one of ours who didn't play with toys. She was climbing over everything, didn't focus, didn't sit down. And now she can do puzzles and she can play appropriately with things and put cars down and ramps. pick and, different things to play mm -hmm. with. And then she's getting something out of that or else she wouldn't do it. And if they don't want to play with their toy, then they don't want to play with that toy. But um, just showing her all the different things that, oh, you can do more than this. And if she likes it, great. Then that's reinforcing in itself, you know, obviously. So if and she then, makes it go down the slide and then it hits the bell, oh, yeah, you know, or, or whatever. And know. then in play group, um, there's a lot of just as far as being in a classroom, we've played with this, let's clean it up. <laughs> let's pick something to play with versus just running around the room. Let's pick something to play with. Let's sit down, yeah, let's play with it. Aimlessly. Yeah, um, there's a lot of working on sharing, working on back and forth, working on you know personal space, not grabbing something, maybe asking a friend for it. You can um, just play next to another kiddo mm -hmm. that's in our, and then maybe playing with, you know, and all these things depend on one age they're getting to, you know, yeah. like our one that's getting ready to leave us next week and go to pre-K, you know, we're working on trading and sharing, sharing and, and trading and understanding that, oh, he's playing with this, so I can't just go up and steal it. I can, I can ask him for it or I can wait or I can ask him to trip, you know, teaching some of those other skills that, that will hopefully mm -hmm. make it better for him when he's around other kids, you know, because, because you know how kids are these days. If you got a kiddo that's always just coming up and screaming at you or stealing a toy, then nobody's going to play with him, you know, we don't want that to happen. We want him. Yeah, and that like particular child else. went up and asked a kid for a bike today and the kid gave it to him and... And that's huge because normally he would have gone up and either yeah. hit him or screamed it, or grabbed yeah. it. Or so, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's great because he's leaving next Friday for pre-K. Yep. <laughs> we have a hard time letting go of some of our kiddos. <laughs> with uh, one of the children who um, they were working on like potty training mm -hmm. um, and I know like for every child that's very different like whether they're ready yeah. or not or whatnot yeah um, so for example maybe if a parent wanted their child to work on that and maybe you guys didn't feel that maybe they were ready yet are you more obligated to um, like do you inform them of that or do you just kind of have to do what the parents requesting or how does that work um, I have a pretty good relationship with all my families and we usually will talk it through. Now, some BCBAs feel that it doesn't matter whether they're ready or not, that with this technique, they can all be potty trained. Um, 
but I, ours is a little bit different. And we have a little bit, you know, they're all about just being in there, to be in the bathroom. You do everything in the bathroom until they go and it kind of learns. But for multiple reasons, we don't, we don't do that because um, when we have DHS involved in this program, they wouldn't want us eating in the bathroom or anything else like that, which is fine <laughs> by me. I don't necessarily want to sit in a little kid bathroom all day long either. Um, so we'll kind of talk it through. Um, you know, if a, if a parent came to me and, you know, this kiddo didn't have any language skills, any attention skills, anything like that, and they're young, I'd say, eh, that's, you're, we're probably going to be beating our head against the wall if we try right now. That's, you know, but if they really wanted to push it, we would probably try it and then kind of show them because we keep that on it just like we do everything else and kind of show, you know, it's not it's not really working. And we, we want the families another. to be on board too so yeah. that they can carry it over in the home. Yeah. Because if we're only doing it here, then it's not going to go. Yeah. So, farther. but most of the time, you know, we can talk that through and stuff like that and figure it out. I'm not going to do anything they don't want to do and I'm, they're not going to, you know. So we'll just kind of see and play it by ear. But, and sometimes kids will surprise us. And we'll think, oh, they're not ready. And we do it for a little bit. And then lo and behold. Mm -hmm. So you just never know. And then we have a lot of kids that will do it here and not at home or vice versa. Or <laughs> I know a lot of people are concerned about um, ABA being used to uh, suppress stimming. Um, I didn't necessarily see that here. Um, so I was interested in maybe um, A, your thoughts on it and B, say it, um, a parent really didn't want their child stimming because they thought that it maybe made them separated from their peers, uh, what you do in those situations. Well, and ours is a little bit different in that, um, first of all, I feel like they're stimming for a reason. They're getting something out of that. Um, you can try to find replacement behaviors and we can try to work on that, but most of the time they're just going to replace it again somewhere along the line with some other kind of stimming behavior. Um, th this is, you know, not necessarily our program's philosophy or anything else, but just my personal philosophy is that, um, that kind of makes these kids like, uh, you know, I saw a thing the other day, I'm happy and I'm flappy, you know, and, you know, and I'm like, that's these kiddos. <laughs> and I think, you know, some kids may, th other kids may think that's weird at first, but then they'll realize, I think that's the part of these being kiddos being with them from the time they're little that they know, oh, when Jack gets real happy, he, you know, flaps, uh -huh. does, shakes his hands or stuff. Now, when it gets into when they're adults or older and you get into puberty type situations and things are a little bit more inappropriate as far as systemic stuff you know that's a whole nother issue mm -hmm. that thank goodness and then i mean you could with. work around social stories or work around um just learning appropriate places and times yeah and, there's definitely um, you know some things like that but we don't try to necessarily stifle some of that um because one like i said they're going to replace it with something else um and that's the other kind of thing that you know most um behavior analysts believe that it, everything is kind of behavior related and they don't necessarily believe in sensory type stuff. But I, I, I myself Well, personally, me and background from school and working with yeah. occupational therapists, we did a ton of I mean, sensory. there's sensory stuff. <laughs> there is. It's not all. We, we have sensory issues. I have my own sensory issues. My <laughs> daughter has her own sensory issues, yeah. you know, and so, but that's most BCBS yeah. and most behavior analysts don't believe that. They believe it's all behavior related. So I think mostly the only time we would really target it is if it's um, impeding upon their learning. Say that it's a vocal stem and they're just You're trying not paying attention and... at all. Yeah, we would need to try to divert that to something else. And sometimes they're just doing it because to relieve some stress and they'll just do it for a minute and then they'll kind of come back to you. And that's what they need to have that break and to do that. And that's, that's okay. We all need yeah. something. And Sometimes we need a break. Well, and that's going to, you know, a lot of this is going to be very different. If you're asking the same questions to somebody, a BCBA, for example, or somebody that, you know, worked at one of the private therapies, you're going to get probably very different answers. And, and ABA has changed a lot. You know, when it first came about in the 60s, you know, when I've looked back and I've seen some videos and stuff, yeah, no, I probably wouldn't. I, there's no well, way I would have had my kid doing it, and I probably wouldn't have been doing it myself. Because although at that time they thought they were doing what they needed to, so you know, you're. Um, I'm sure like a lot of your viewers will see. You know, if you're an adult with um, on the spectrum at this point, and if you had an experience of ABA when you were a child, it's very different than now. And I can see where that was probably a bad experience for mm -hmm. them back then, because it's changed so much. Yeah, and I think us having education backgrounds, um, we've kind of seen and been around and we like to take the best from <laughs> everywhere like if this is working let's do it if this is working let's do it well and know? even most behavior analysts believe that you know it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of thing um 
because you know that's why we say it's a spectrum these kiddos are all very different um, not only very different from themselves but like I said the other day very different um, from their friends very different in themselves from day to day you know something may work one day and the next day it doesn't so that's why we kind of believe you know that you might use kind of a cafeteria of things you know you might throw in some floor time or some different things um, so that's why I kind of feel that you know it's just all depends on the kiddo and, and like you were saying um, you know a, a kid may not sit down for 40 hours a week <laughs> Literally, I so for us, for you know, <laughs> our schedule is built around, you know, this much work time. Now we're going to get up and we're going to do play. Now we'll do a work time, something else where we're getting up and we're moving around. So we like to incorporate a lot of that. Yeah. Um, if we have a long sitting period, then we're going to be doing something where we're up, mm -hmm. where we're outside or just play or whatever else. We're not going to have all those. So we're like sitting, 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 because it's, yeah. it's a lot and it's a lot for me even so. We probably would go about it with our motivators first, yeah. try to find things that are more, because I mean, they're getting reinforcement from their vocal stem. <laughs> so trying to find something that's more reinforcing than that, that we could then use to reinforce with the work that we're trying to do would probably be the first thing I would try. Yeah. And then they'll start to learn when they can, when it's, they can do it when it's better to be working on. And there's sometimes you may just have to sit and wait for them to, we had a little girl that, um, she would go through her scripts. little scripts and uh -huh. you know you have to wait till we the have end. to wait till the end <laughs> of that little blurb it, yeah. because <laughs> you weren't gonna get anywhere so like blah 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 actually you have to wait for the whole thing but then you go on with the next thing and then yeah then, i mean that's just part of it and you kind of that's what i like about our program and, well, and i think motor doing motor breaks i think is very key too wow you know we're sitting here and we're stimming maybe we should get up and do something else maybe we should bounce on a ball maybe we should you know run around outside for a little bit and kind of get them out of it out of that um stem and then see if we can come back and work so i think the the schedule how we have it helps with that too because we don't really we haven't really had a whole lot of that other than you know she had a lot of those scripting mm -hmm. vocal things but they didn't really i mean she would stop once she got to the end of her little and you were ho always hoping it wasn't a real long script <laughs> then she was okay you know and stuff so it wasn't it, like a whole even, show or something but even like words we would say would start the script oh yeah we'd be like oh man i said that word <laughs> oh man i said sheep oh, oh. No, now we're gonna hear, have to hear oh blah blah black sheep <laughs> you knew it right after it came out <laughs> <but> yeah <laughs> so Well, when my girls start, as um, as I train, as new people come in, I didn't have to do a lot of training with Kim, but what, the very first thing I do with my girls when they come in, unless they've had a background in this already, is what is autism. That's my first training that I do. Um, and it's just given the basics, kind of, you know, where it came from, where the terminology came from, what the spectrum is, how the, you know, the DSM-5 and how it's diagnosed and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I go to like a discrete trial training, teaching them the, just the basics of that discrete trial, teaching the ABA. Um, and then we'll have them kind of be with a kid for a little bit. And then we're going to work on a, we have a behavior training, kind of that positive behavior support training. And then we have a play training, working on those play skills after they've been here for a little bit. So really I do it all. And even my families that come in where we do family trainings as well. And it's pretty much kind of the same. It's obviously, they're gonna be slightly different from teaching a family about it to teaching somebody that's gonna be doing it. But we start out with what is autism? Uh -huh. Cause some of these families know nothing other than things they've read on the internet, which we know can be very scary um, and maybe misinforming. <laughs> so, um, and you've done those trainings at the child care center also yeah, I've also for the teachers because our kids yeah. will go into their classrooms and so so i do a lot of these trainings mm -hmm. for our site as a whole i even have gone um a friend of mine runs the speech path department at tu and for those beginning speech path um students i'll go and do what is autism and do the basics of just that and talk about all the different therapies and, and different things like that as a whole so I mean, I don't know. I don't think any Probably of Probably in this program, no. No. Mm -hmm. um, they, they I just, kind of, I'll bring it up a little bit in my mm -hmm. initial stuff, but most of mine, no. I think some of my girls now 
um, are, especially that Kim got hers, um, are wanting to look into their RBT and they'll know more about, I think, that as part of that program. Yeah, because you have to learn the history of ABA yeah. when you go through your registered behavior type um, certification. But I, so. yeah, I don't know about all the other places. I would think so. I would think that would be part of it. I, I would want that to be. They need to know kind of the history of it and why it's come the way it has and why it changed and, but. I mean, obviously I'm a huge proponent of mm -hmm. early intervention. I've worked in the field for 22 years and, you know, especially, and not just with autism, but just seeing any kiddo, you know, you'll see a kiddo that, and, and obviously when they have diagnoses like Down syndrome or whatever else that they know about at birth, obviously the quicker you get in there and start working on stuff, the better, you know, you can get some of these um, things taken care of, you know, whereas like a preemie even, you know, might have some delays at first and then they don't even need us anymore, you know, and that's our goal. You know, obviously the goal of early intervention is that when they turn three and leave us, that they don't need us anymore mm -hmm. and that's great. We want to basically put ourselves out of a job. We don't want, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want to have to be there, you know. Um, obviously when there's things like Down syndrome or cerebral palsy or, you know, different there's you know millions of different kinds of syndromes and things that's not always the case but we still want them to be have as much um chance mm -hmm. and and to do things and and as early as normal to say that then you know say um and because a lot of kids aren't you know especially if they're pretty high functioning on the, you know what they used to say asperger's and different things like that and it's not around anymore but you know some of those kids may not be caught until they go to school you know especially if they're just with mom, they've never been in a preschool program or anything else, or, you know, if you don't have any, mom didn't have any, you know, experience with other kiddos to realize, hey, this was a little bit quirky, you know, they might not be cut to school. Now, that's not saying that then they won't continue to catch up and do things like that, but um, obviously, if it's there and it's yeah. free. And when they're young and when they're small, I know we've said a lot, um, certain behaviors, um, you know, <laughs> It's gonna get worse as they get older because they're bigger. I mean, physically bigger. So if we can, you know, change this into a different, more appropriate behavior now, that's gonna Before really help it's been out. Reinforced for three because, years, um, five years. It's like I said, working with adults um, in the job setting. I mean, we we'll, we would have chairs flying, and that's scary when you have a very large individual um, who could physically harm a lot of people. So if we can get in when they're young and they're little, and we can kind of you know work through that at that point, then that's going to help them progress into other skills later. So yeah, I I'm agree. Early intervention I think is key, and it's. Um, it's really necessary. Well, and, and there's really, I mean, like I said, it's free. We come to you. I mean, you know, as far as like the early mentor programs in Oklahoma, it's Sooner Start. You know, they come to you. They come to your house. It's free. It's, you know, they, we try to make it as accessible as, as possible so that we are catching these kiddos and doing what we can early on so that, you know, hopefully they won't need anything at that point. But even if they do, you know, but, but like I said, I still think kiddos, it's just harder once, once, Problem behaviors have been reinforced. For the longer so long. they have been reinforced, the harder it is to break them. Um, yeah. Like here, an example um, is we had a little guy that anytime mom left the home, he flipped out. And so dad learned that if I give him a sucker for each hand, he calms down. Well, so what that really taught him is if I scream and cry, I get a sucker. And so, but that behavior had been reinforced for a long time. So it took a long, even longer time to change that behavior to where he could either find other ways of calming down or not being upset when mom leaves or different things like that. But that had been reinforced for, and that's with anything. That's with any kind of kiddo, like, you know, babies. Babies learn very early how to kind of, I hate to use this word, but manipulate their environment. And, you know, they learn. I cry and somebody feeds me. I cry and somebody picks me up. So I would cry and, you know, and so then, you know, you're going to go with whatever behavior works yeah. the fastest. And, <laughs> and so then you get into sleeping issues and they've learned, I cry, somebody comes in and picks me up. Well, they need to learn to obviously sleep through the night. So there's, you know, ways of, but it's just what we do as humans and even animals and stuff have learned those kinds of things. I've always wanted to try ABA with my dog and the <laughs> teacher. <laughs> I probably do it with my husband and my own kids without really realizing yeah. that I do some of it <laughs> to change some of those behaviors. <laughs> I 
I mean, I don't know. A whole I would say lot. I probably am not as much um, because I feel like my experience have, has been positive with this program. Um, and we're mainly mainly dealing with little kids and mm-hmm. stuff. You know, I've not been around too many adults that, uh, and even the adults you were around couldn't necessarily verbalize if they had been through it, been through that, and didn't yeah. like it or whatever else. So I know um, from what I understand is that a lot of them do feel like. It, it almost changes our personality a little bit, like the stimming or different things like that. I think also it was, they felt like it was very um, restrictive and, and things like that. Um, but that's about all I know. And let know that our program isn't like that, not to say there aren't still others out there. But like I said, somebody that's an adult now and had ABA as a child probably does have a, probably a bad taste in their mouth from that because mm-hmm. it's very different and was probably pretty hardcore at that point. So changed a lot and I just always welcome them to come I mean our program is a learning program and we're a research program and everything else and I'd love for anybody can always come and, and see it and everything else so I know you can't necessarily do that on all the private places because of HIPAA and privacy and, and all that kind of stuff so but just to kind of see how different it can be and, but that's still their option and that's their opinion and that's that's what they knew and that's what they went through They can't yeah, if it's one on one, but they can't if there's another kiddo in there. Yeah, way. they don't. They don't just like you said with the HIPAA and privacy. Um, yeah, so they could come and observe like in a room like this with the therapist working with the kid. Um, their kid. Their kid. Yeah. But they couldn't go like in a room like ours uh-huh. where there's multiple kids in there. Yeah. Because uh, where ours is a little bit more open. I mean, they all know and like I had you sign releases right. and that kind of thing, but um, it's a little bit different. So. That's the hard part. But yeah, you can go in and be with your kid. Mm-hmm. So like you would have to have your child already um, in the program for you to come see it uh, in private practices? Or? Yeah, because you wouldn't be able to see the other kiddos, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. That'd be the hard part is yeah, just not knowing. I was wondering about yeah. like, yeah, because I know some people can, you know, answer in a certain way that doesn't sound a certain way and yeah. well, maybe yeah. they practice it differently than the parent thought and you mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing. I was just wondering. Well, they can you know, observe their child. Yeah, yeah, but they're, they're wanting if they're thinking about want seeing whether it's appropriate for their child and want to observe, then no, they would not at those kind of prices. They can't hear they my can family have have all, um, and see the program and stuff, but they can actually see it being done with a kiddo or something. Unless I mean, maybe if there was like a cousin, you know, somebody they knew and they could get some stuff. But even then, they're going to be pretty mm-hmm. strict about it. They have to be because of all the HIPAA gotcha. stuff. That's one thing. I always have my families come and see first because I can explain them to to them till I'm blue in the face until you actually see it done because a lot of our families are like oh he's never going to sit for that long a time he's never going to do this and then they come in and they see it and they're like oh yeah yeah." so you do for kids even before they've decided if they want to come to the program they come and they Mm -hmm. observe and they you give a tour and show them what we do yeah Well, first and foremost, we're going to figure out what the function of that behavior is. We have what's called an FBA, Functional Behavior Assessment, where we keep data because it may look like something at first, but it could be something completely different. So that's the first thing we need to know what the function, what they're getting from that behavior. Um, and then we're going to go about, you know, trying to have replacement behaviors for that. You know, if it's biting or hitting or... Yeah, are they wanting, um, you know, are they wanting attention? And you know, the they, way they're getting they attention is screaming, well, let's give them lots and lots of positive attention. Let's play with them. Let's... <laughs> so that they know lots of other is, ways. This is how that. we get attention. Let's ask. Let's, yeah. And well, and a good example is, you know, uh, one of our little guys he didn't really understand he wanted to interact with one of the other kiddos in there but he didn't really know how to do that and so his thing would be to go up and kind of hit him push him you know push him you know and to other people be like oh he's mean he's a mean kid well no he's not he just doesn't understand he's really just saying hey Mm -hmm. i want to play with you but he doesn't know how to do that so teach him to wave so we're teaching them or even to touch lightly or Mm -hmm. bring a toy you know teaching them the appropriate way of doing that so and he does that yeah he does now (laughs) he's Great, and then he gets all sad when she doesn't want to play with him. But <laughs> he looks at us like, "Why do that? Why is it she?" <laughs> yeah, but definitely, you know, we see a behavior. We have to know what happened before <laughs> and what happened after. So that all it comes into play as far it's as basically like, the ABCs. What happened mm-hmm. right before that behavior? What What's is the behavior? behavior? And then what was the consequence, or what did he get out of that behavior? Mm-hmm. You know, so, and then we start looking to see if we're seeing a pattern of it's always happening at snack time or it's always happening at transition times or it's always happening, 
you know, whatever else. It's always and, work time, so they yeah. don't want to come to the table. Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. It's a way to make that more fun to do okay. that, obviously, because we don't um, want it to be feel like work all mm -hmm. the time, even though it's what we call it, but still fun time and stuff. And we have a lot of things in place that help with those kinds of things, too. We use a lot of visuals, visual schedules, um, visual reinforcement boards. Um, we'll have a first then, like... Like one of our little guys, I mean, the only thing you ever want to play with, you want to be on the computer all the time. Well, that's great, except that here, if you do a puzzle first, then you can play on the computer. If you, you know, blow bubbles for a minute and then play on the, you know, a lot of first mm -hmm. things and lots of visuals because these kids are very, very visual. You and can then, sit there and blah, 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 blah to them till it, and they're like... Okay. I'm trying to think ahead for... We know that this always happens at this time. So tomorrow, here's how are we going to manipulate the, the environment to where we can avoid that happening? So we try to keep it from happening at all rather uh -huh. than trying to deal with it. Being proactive versus reactive. Yeah. So like in the situation um, before, you know, you've identified it or maybe found a way to manipulate the environment to avoid that. Um, say that they're, you know, screaming to get what they want. Uh, what do you do in that moment? I mean, if they've already gone through some of the programs, um, you know, I might uh, have them manned for it. Say it's a ball. Ball, what do you want? Ball. See if they'll say ball. Maybe I'll try point to have them point to it. Um, yeah, so just in the moment, yeah, trying to get them to do a more appropriate behavior. And, then, and make sure we're um, not reinforcing that behavior. This, but it may be that... You know, screaming, I give you the ball, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, so if I'm sitting here screaming because I want that piece of paper, she may kind of even remove herself to show you're not going to get any attention for that, that bad yeah. behavior, but as soon as you're quiet and then you show a point paper. Yeah. And so we try to, but sometimes those behaviors last a while. It can take a while to work through. Some, I mean, yeah. that's just less with any kiddo when you have a tantrum mm -hmm. or different things like that, that might take a little bit, but especially if that in the past has gotten him what he wanted and needed, it takes a little longer to show him, Hey, this is much easier. If you just pointed instead of him scream for 30 minutes, look how much easier that is for you. <laughs> and all of us. So, so in those situations, uh, do you ever utilize uh, what I've heard called planned ignoring, where, um, from my understanding, is you would ignore the behavior that they are doing that you don't want them to do to get the item until they basically do something or you may be prompted mm -hmm. to do something that... I wouldn't say necessarily a plan, but we will. And some of our kids, <clears throat> the more you try to talk to them or interact with them or anything else when they're in a tantrum like that, makes it worse. And so we will. So as long as they're safe, everybody else is safe sometimes we will just kind of let them get out of their system for a minute mm -hmm. and ignore them and not try to give them any because they may be looking for your attention they yeah. may be looking for um <laughs> i mean we just don't know yeah and sometimes they don't know why yeah. they're doing it yeah they're just they're just mad yeah, they're just frustrated or and mad it's hard to, to it redirect to them or, while yeah. they're that mad so they need to calm down first um and we have some safe spots and sometimes you know like our little guy right now sometimes we just have to kind of let him scream and get it out of his system for a minute because the more we try to do things then he's going to go into it. not only am i screaming now but now i'm gonna start throwing stuff off the shelves or different things like that and then you get into safety mm -hmm. issues you know and stuff but so yeah I mean, we we're do, not going to restrain him we're we not going to wait it out a lot just wait it out <laughs> and then and then when they're calm and showing that you can keep doing it but you're still not going to get what you're still not get ultimately you're not going to get that until we show you an appropriate behavior so and that's the thing is once those behaviors are being reinforced you know say before i've screamed and i got what i wanted when i'm screaming i'm not getting it so i'm going to scream and stomp my feet they are going to up the yeah. ante for a little bit until they finally realize this still is not getting me what i want and we're going to show them a much easier and better way for them to get what they want that's more appropriate as well i know that it's difficult even in just general for people to tell the difference between maybe what a meltdown is and a tantrum is. Um, how do you guys handle meltdowns? Is that just kind of a similar kind of thing? Just let them... It it's all just depends. I mean, it's going to probably look different just about every time. It's it depends. Reason for it. You know, and we can generally tell the difference between what is a normal two-year-old being a two... It's being a normal two... Uh, not normal, just being a two-year-old and being kind of a two versus... I'm overstimulated, mm -hmm. I'm having issues, I'm frustrated because I can't tell you what I want. You know, we can kind of see the difference mm -hmm. in some of that. Not everybody obviously can. And so it's going to look a little different each time. That's the thing. And that's, and that's why I like our program is that we don't have yeah. this. This is the way it's always handled. No. Because, for example, you know, we had all the kids lining up at the back door from the other class. And, and you said, back up, you're too close. Because you knew, like, that could be an environment that might make this child overstimulated, you know. Um, so 
there's, yeah, there's, there's, oh, it's too loud, you're too close, there's all that that we're taking into context. Um, uh, and we don't want to take those things away because that's the real world. Uh -huh. We, you know, don't always, I mean, there's times that we can do that, but we don't want to always make it a quiet, dark environment because that's not the real world and they're going to have to go out into that. And so we want to teach them ways of handling that and of being able to deal with some of those issues. You know, maybe it's we, we wear sunglasses my space, or, or MySpace yeah. or we wear earphones or whatever, you know, and times we know. So, you know, we don't want to make this, this is the only way they can function is in this environment because that's not the world. And yeah. we, they've got to be able to go places. And that's why a lot of our families, a lot of families of kiddos on the spectrum are very isolated because of that very reason. You know, uh, they don't feel like they can go to restaurants. They don't feel like they can go to Walmart because you just never know when that's going to strike a meltdown or something. Maybe too loud there, maybe too bright, maybe. Yeah. And then you just, like I said, you got typical kids that, I mean, typical issues with kids that, I want this toy, I want that toy, you know, and they don't understand why. And yeah. a good example right now is we have a family that um, has not been able to go to family and friend birthday parties because he, when it comes time to open those gifts, he doesn't understand why then he can't take one of those with him. And so we're actually writing a social story for him so that we can prep him beforehand because they're having to leave family gatherings and things like that because and then then they feel bad too because they feel like the family's judging them mm -hmm. that he's just a two-year-old too just being you know or whatever else and it's not it's not that yeah. easy and so we want to make that because it's hard when you can't ever do normal things you can't go to the grocery store you can't go out to eat you can't go to family gatherings either and a lot of our families don't go to their family christmases and stuff like that because it's too much and that's sad so we want to make sure that they can I can do that. So, and can you just briefly explain what it, you said a social story and um, what that kind of means? Or you want to talk about it since you just did? Yeah. Oh, this is <laughs> so, um, kind of just any social situation, breaking it down into steps, like um, so that so that the kid will know like what's going to happen. What do I expect here? So in this particular one, it's just like um, birthday parties are fun. I get to see my friends and my family and we want to put like specific um, pictures of him having gone to birthday parties and places he's gone to birthday parties and him having fun at birthday parties and here and I usually I want to say like here are the things I get to do at birthday parties you know I get cake. to play games I get to eat cake and ice cream <laughs> so you know keeping it positive yes this is a fun environment and then we want to kind of address like kind of the, <laughs> the issue and so um, at birthday parties we watch other kids open presents. Those presents are their presents. It's their birthday. <laughs> and so through visuals, you know, I think what we're thinking now is to kind of have the kid opening the presents and then kind of like have to put an X on it just because. And then I said, um, but then have things that I can do. I can say cool. I can say wow. I can smile. I can choose some toys from home to bring that I can play with that are mine. Um, and then, um, and then having pictures of him at his birthday party where he does get to he, keep yeah. all his stuff uh -huh. and those are his and nobody else gets to And keep. so this would be something that they could read to him every night at bedtime, you know. We just want to read it. We want to read it well in advance and a lot of times before the actual situation happens so that that's in his head. And remember, this is what's going to happen. This is how we can react. Um, and, and making it visual. Make, that's the key. The visuals, yeah. I mean, really and social stories go all the way up to... Um, teens and young adults learning how to go to the store and buy their own mm -hmm. thing, you know, first we have our money and then, you know, set out into whatever steps and it can be as basic or as, as involved as they need to be. So we haven't really done too many of them here because our kids are pretty little, but they use them a lot mm -hmm. with older kiddos. Places might teach uh, to the point where, you know, when you say a certain thing, that's what they're going to do, you know, at the end of the day to get to that point. Um, is there a way that you can teach them like there are people we don't comply to. Um, that is kind of one of the concerns that a lot of people have is that, you know, mm -hmm. being taught that all the adults are allowed to tell me what to do in any mm -hmm. case and I have to do it. Um, and of course that opens concern for like yeah. abusive situations oh, yeah. and yeah. stuff oh, like yeah. that. Well, I mean, I think you just address that like you would with any kiddo as they're growing up and teaching them that, you know, strangers or people like that. I mean, it's, it's part of the safety. Unfortunately, a lot of times these kiddos don't really understand right and wrong safety and all that kind of stuff yet. They don't, um, it's kind of a, you know, either, either scared of everybody or everybody's their best friend. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say, I mean, we haven't 
That's we definitely don't. a valid point. Yeah, I mean, very I, important. Uh, as they get older, ours. Teach. You know, ours, we don't have to worry about that too much yet because they're pretty um, little, but I think... I mean, I could have one example from when I worked in the job setting. Um, there was an individual who loves to mail people letters. And so he would always ask, first meeting a person, what's your name, what's your address? <laughs> well, and you know, I mean, that's... To a friendly, nice person, that's okay, but we don't know who this person is. They're a stranger, you know, and so teaching some boundaries there and who it's okay to ask that to. <laughs> and who it's if you've just met a person we're not going to ask that information you know and giving out your information to a person so yeah um case by case individual by individual and, and breaking it down and yeah. breaking it down into the different social components that go into when is it okay to ask for an address when is it not okay to ask for an address you know um through social stories through practice through role play you can work on those situations because, yeah, that, I mean, I, I get it. I mean, I mm -hmm. worry about that with my own daughter. So, yeah, I mean, it's when they learn that even though this person's a teacher, they might be trying to ask you to do something that's not mm -hmm. right, especially with all the things you've seen on the news lately. But, yeah, I mean, fortunately, that's just something you kind of have to, as they get the, where they can understand some of that, you know. Some of our kids might not ever truly understand some of that, what's, inappropriate what's not and you know it's kind of but yeah no we definitely don't want to teach you have to comply to any adult no matter what no. or when or where <laughs> no yeah especially with the scary world these days mm -hmm. do you have any concerns about teaching children who are so young um, such high external motivation versus intrinsic motivation um, well and we start out and that's and that's why we fade those things we start out with something that is huge, powerful, they love it, they're gonna get it every time. Mm -hmm. But then after they're here for a little bit, they start learning um, that, it's, that they don't necessarily get it every time. They have to do more things. So we start fading those reinforcers because yeah, in the real world, that's not the real you're not gonna yeah. always have, like I said, a pocket of Skittles or whatever else. So that's how we do it to teach them how to teach it, basically how to learn. And then we start um, fading those out. And then um, so we that, always pair it with social reinforcement. Yeah. We want to tell them, I love how you're sitting, else, good job having a quiet voice, yeah. And, and so then, then hopefully that will start to be more intrinsically motivating or, you know. Well, even and well, and then a lot of them intrinsically, you know, they can, oh, now I know how to play with this toy and I like it and I get something mm -hmm. out of that because it's true. fun for me, Yeah, you know, or um, I've learned how to appropriately ask for something so my intrinsic motivator is that I got it and I get to play with it or eat it or whatever else. So, you know, we don't, we understand that that's not something you always, and so that's, those are faded and to the point where mm -hmm. it is just motivating for them because they did yeah. it or they got it or they got what they were wanting or, So you usually know. if it's a new skill, you're going to see us reinforcing more often. And then once they kind of <laughs> gain independence with it, less often, and then hopefully we don't have to at all. So. And less powerful and less. Yeah. Because, I mean, for like, I was with my kid today in the playgroup setting, and it um, doesn't always work out this well, but he was waiting very well. And <laughs> all I had to do was just say, wait, wait. And that's one of our programs, and I'm not handing him a Skittle to wait. Um, so. Then, and then he, by waiting, then he got the toy that he uh -huh. was waiting on. So that was his motivator, you know. So, yeah, we try to work on that it's not going to always be a tangible or edible or something that's right there that they're going to get something out of it, like I said, communicating or playing with a toy or, you know, obviously older, mm -hmm. you know. But I could say, Learning you know, to do a job and then you get paid, you know, or. Working you know. in an environment where we didn't use any of that, um, I really struggled with getting their attention at all because they were not into whatever task I had at hand. Why would I pay attention to this? Why would I do this? Um, um, they're like, what am I getting out of it? There's nothing. So, so we were getting nowhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. I definitely see the benefit, like like we said in the beginning, a lot, and then try to fade it out. That's one of the things I liked about this program. We all have to wait two weeks to a month for a paycheck, you know. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> yeah. We have to learn to wait on things. Yes. ABA teaches autistic children how to learn. Um, do you agree with that statement, and in like maybe what capacity you feel that? I don't know that necessarily teaches them how to learn per se. But maybe to attend. Yeah, that's the component. main thing. It's just, I mean, you can't learn anything if you're not even paying attention to it. And that's a lot of our kids. And that's why we'll see them some days, you know, they're on it and they're doing it and they're with us. And then there's some days they're like, and you're like, 
-hmm. and you're not and if they can't pay attention yeah. and that's the ultimate goal is getting them to pay attention they're gonna need that yes. for everything in life and so I mean they know how to learn it's just, yeah. <laughs> they can learn and they will learn but, yeah but I mean, if they're not learn. attending to the thing that we're wanting them to learn then it's a lost cause so so I wouldn't say necessarily in those strict terms but mm -hmm. I mean I think it helps and it's just part of it but um, it, lots of other things yeah, yeah could too. I mean. just you know like circle time in the classroom um, if we had a brand new kid they're probably not sitting they're probably not looking they have not taken in anything that's happening so we're gonna work on you know the sitting skills the attending skills the imitation skills to do you know do the clapping do the arm whatever the teachers doing gymnastics as well um, we have gymnastics today and our kids when they first come in it's like what am I doing why am I here but now we have kids that will sit and they'll attend and they'll follow her instructions and so they're getting some because art, we've worked fun. on those skills yeah. so and like yeah. circle time now we don't have to reinforce them in circle time that's they're getting out of it because mm -hmm. they're part of it and they enjoy it and they get to help pick songs or whatever we're doing with them so like as they're getting older do they approach new skills uh, new learning situations with the same uh, method or do they kind of move on from that or what well, it kind of I mean when we start out when the first kids when a kid first comes to us and we're learning those basic new programs and they're kind of learning how to do this it's very it's it's a little more written I wouldn't say rigid per se it's still pretty fluid but more so than it is and so we start out and we're reinforcing them all the time and we're doing it this way but as they go along we usually don't have to do that um, mm -hmm. especially once they've moved up and they're at the older room when we do those other programs we don't have to do it we can still be doing even though it's a new skill, we can still be kind of intermittently reinforcing or not being as, but because they've kind of learned how to, those skills right. already as far as how to learn and yeah, and structured. But I mean, that's not to say that they're still not going to come in contact with something and be like, oh, you know, I don't. And and like, it, and we worry about our little guy that's transitioning because obviously the school setting is going to be a whole lot different. It's not one on one, and that's the hard part of when they leave us and go to that is that it has been one on one, and all our focus has been on them. Um, now, especially that I think he's going into just a regular pre-K class until they get all his testing done and everything else. You know, there could be 25, 30 kids in there with one teacher. Well, I mean, in my, even though I think with, a, with support he could handle that situation, but if you just throw him in there like that, you're setting both he and the teacher and really all those other kids up for failure because he's going to require a lot of attention that's going to take her away then she's not able to do this and so you know we're trying for, to have these you know and each school district is very different obviously um some want to automatically throw him into a special ed classroom some of them like this one want to wait and see how he does when i'm trying to tell him hey we've had him for two three years i can tell you how he's going to do and but if they want to figure that out themselves that's up to them but we you know that's I start the transition progress I mean process about a year out and so that these schools hopefully know what's gonna happen and so they're not just getting this kid because pre-k is hard anyway you've got kids coming in there that may have never been in any kind of structured environment before at all or daycare or anything and so pre-k is kind of crazy at first anyway so then you add a kiddo like this into it and and there are some kids that do end up with their own paras. Um, we've had some that graduated and have had their own paras. Or share a pair so, with another um, kid. Or... We may yeah, give information and tips that would help in working with the kid and they can kind of... I can, I'm can. i even available to go at first when I first go to school and different things. Nobody's taking us up on that, but that's okay. But um, just so that it's, it helps them. But I try to give them as much information yeah. as possible. Like we just sent over the stuff for school for him. You know, we've talked about some of his... You know stuff that they're not going to see when they do testing and when they see testing results they don't see anything about him so you know what we fill out this little form that talks about what is he like what's what's hard for him what's what's easy for him what's what are his strengths what's kind of sets him off where you know some of those kinds of things so that will help a little bit we hope but not generally especially if it's a pretty powerful one there'll be some things where um like especially the older ones it may be that during playtime he's latched onto a toy and is playing so we're going to take it back to the table and use it as a reinforcer or whatever he's playing with at that time and some of them the reinforcers we do what's called a reinforcer assessment on a regular basis some of them you know some of my first kids would have worked for one of my very first kiddos he would have worked for cheetos and skittles all day long but and edibles are obviously the best because you don't have to take them away so they're one of the easiest but 
um, it just kind of depends. I mean, generally, no, we have the box of their reinforcers because yeah. we want them to still be powerful. They, we don't want them to get saturated because yeah. sometimes the parents will be like, oh, he loves that toy, I'm going to buy it for home. I'm like, no, 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 not unless you're going to use it for something because then if he can have it all the time, then it's they not get powerful it, anymore. Then they don't want it. Yeah, so yeah. we want it to still be powerful. But at some point, really just any kind of play with them or toys or different edibles or anything are, are reinforcing. And we want them. ourselves to be reinforcing too. We want yeah. ourselves to be fun and to, <laughs> to interact with. And, be, yeah, yeah. Positive reinforcement form. So it kind of depends. I guess that's a long answer. <laughs>I don't, mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means. Just when you're trying to, like if loud noises were a thing, you're going to experience, have them experience a lot of loud noises all the time yeah, and hope no. that it desensitizes mm -hmm. them. No, we no. don't do that here. We have yeah. not done that. No. And, I, and I wouldn't <laughs> no. probably. Mm -mm. That'd be one of those things that I would feel like. No. Because I know if I had an issue and you just kept pounding on me, then I'm probably going to be like, yeah. just shut down and, and <laughs> yeah. curl up into a ball. and. <laughs> But I mean, I'm sure it does work for some people sometimes, you know, like people that have, what is it, agoraphobia where they don't like to leave the house or whatever. And obviously they have to be able to leave the house, right. you know, and so but maybe do it in smaller steps. Or... Yeah. Because I mean, something like a loud noise to me is something that is internal and that's, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and with those kinds of things, like with my own teach sensory stuff, mechanisms. yeah, teach different coping mechanisms yeah. versus being like able to just handle it. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't like loud noises, and I'm going to no. turn down the radio. So maybe I'll put like some it. headphones on. And well, maybe I'll go to a different room, or maybe. And I'll... these kiddos, just like us, I mean, it's different. You know, some days they may be able to handle it better than other days. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my sensory things is having I. I don't like necklaces or tall shirts, but there's some days I can wear a necklace. There's some days I can have it on for now, an and I'm like, oh my god, I gotta get this off. You know, there's, we all have those different things and we've learned and there's, like I said, some days are better than others and some days you can handle things better than others. Yeah. And there's some days you're like, oh my God, who's that screaming down the hall, four doors down. And other days you're like, oh, I didn't even realize somebody was screaming. You know, it's just, yeah. and so versus teaching them teaching that coping mechanisms versus, versus more, yeah, you know, just yeah. But that again is my opinion. Person. not, <laughs> I just know that I wouldn't. Ugh. Our, with ours, it is airless teaching, but it's it's more to show them, because even when we do what's called an error correction, mm -hmm. it's very flat. We, we're not like, no, that's not, and we don't even usually say no. We try mm -hmm. to keep it, um, <clears throat> for example, what we do is when we're first teaching something, we are going to do four trials, and we're going to prompt them so that they get it right, so that they're basically learning how to do it. So, for example, if Kim wanted this pen, and she's like this, I'm going to show her how to point. Oh, good job pointing and give her the pin and, and reinforce that four times. And then we're going to do a trial and see whether they got it or not. And so then I'm going to say, what do you want? And if she still just tries to grab for it, I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not doing what I did. This is doing what I did. Not, no, that's wrong or, you know, anything like that. It's, and we're just real. So then you teach it again. And then you teach it again and you go through and, and you go and back prompt and... four times again and then you do a trial again. And it may be that we do this for weeks, months. It may be that after a few times they're like, oh, when I did that, then I got it, and you know, woo, and then we make a big deal of it. But when we're doing their corrections, we're very, you know, we're not happy about it, but we're not, but they're still being reinforced even at an error correction because during an error correction, I'm like, I'm sorry, that's not, and I'm gonna help them do it. So they're still getting it and getting it right, but they, so they're still getting a, a reinforcer, but it's not maybe the biggest reinforcer, it may not be what, but because they still got it right because we prompted them. So, and we want to keep that kind of flat so they don't think they're in trouble or that's wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but then when they do it independently on their own, it's like a party. We want that to be a much bigger reaction and thing so they understand, oh, that's when I did it and I want that. I like that. I like when she did that or gave me a high five mm -hmm. or woo -hoo, And what was your question about the airless teaching? Um, what did you ask specifically? That whether that makes them think that it's, wrong to get like, it wrong or like yeah oh, okay like gotcha. develop a fear of failure gotcha yeah yeah no we're definitely not putting the focus on mm -mm. not <laughs> us anyway yeah i mean not that some of ours and wrong. you know a little guy that we've talked about a lot anytime you have to really watch how you say it with him because He's used to getting them mostly right now, and so when he does get one wrong, he that, gets can, mad. that can kind yeah, of Yeah, so sometimes I don't even say, I'm sorry, Yeah, that's not whatever. I just, you know, kind of he didn't do it right, and, and I'm on. like, oh, and I'll, yeah, I'll do the prompt. He'll do it, and then I'll wait a little bit. 
and then I'll try it again with the prompt and then he'll get it so he feels more success than, yeah. Because we have had times where they'll just scream. The time you have yeah. to do an error correction, they'll scream or... Yeah. And some of it's like hard because a lot, it of right. it, a lot of our prompting is hand over hand, at least to start out with. And some of them, like he, when he first started, man, he didn't want you touching him if you mm -hmm. go to try to prompt him. So we... If we try and we have different levels of prompting you know maybe if we first start out like with prompting that you're fully on grabbing their hand and doing that it may be that you're just doing this or it may be that you're it's even a verbal gesturing thing or gesturing or, or you know because yeah. some of those kids don't like that and that's okay and we'll try to work with that and, and we obviously are fading those prompts too and and to less to work what we need and getting it independent yeah so so at least here no i don't think it's a detrimental mm -hmm type thing that they're mm -hmm. upset oh no i miss i'm afraid to get it wrong i don't even want to try again right there's a 2015 study basically that they did um, where autistic people tend to, when something is repeated, they're not capable or it's very difficult for them to generalize that. Um, so do you feel that DTT is conducive with the way that many autistics um, tend to learn or what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that somewhat comes back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the first place. I learned it in the second place, even mm -hmm. though they were both discrete trial it was very different and I think that I can see where that would be an issue if where you, were you just only told, learned it here at the table and you're only going to do it and there here wasn't at the any table. generalization then yeah mm -hmm. it's like I said it's kind of like Pavlov's dog I've learned I do this and I get this but I yeah. have no idea why I'm doing this yeah. or how to build on that and, and ours always goes with, table and then we do it in different locations with and different with toys different people with different, different toys items. in different in play group and, and even the home. skill can be a different skill you know we might have imitation with objects and during the first three sets where we're teaching it they're the same three activities or imitation things but then by generalization i can do anything mm -hmm. that's an imitation making up different yeah so that they do. learn yeah. that because it's we not want, just that's the goal because it's not about whether they can i put Shake a block in a cup or they put a block uh -huh. in a cup or i clap my hands they clap their hands it's not about that that's not the skill we're working on we want them to learn to pay attention and imitate so then to work on then you learn to imitate social skills mm -hmm. and play skills and language skills and those kinds of things so yeah but yeah, the place it's I first... It's definitely an issue. It is, it <laughs> and is. So we try to... And that's why I, I wasn't really on board after I went to that first place and was learning that because I was like... They don't know why I'm they're not, clapping their hand. They no, don't know I'm why not they're... seeing... Yeah. Yeah, you can do this all day long and they're going to learn just like you could do that with a dog or anything else. I learned that I do this and I get right this. Right here but, at the table I do yeah. this, but nowhere else. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, not only this, the skills we mix up, but like I said, you know, even if... He's sitting with me right here and I'm doing it. And then she sits down, even though we're the same situation, same everything, it's a different person. It might be like he's never seen that before. And we want him to, we want them obviously to be able to do it in lots of environments, with lots of people, with lots of yeah. items, with the, just change it up as much as possible. And that was one of the things I was really, really loved about this program is the generalization piece of it. So, and then everything kind of builds on an, another part of it. I wouldn't say we want them to blend in. We just want them to be able to function mm -hmm. in those yeah. situations and just learn the skills they need to learn. That's kind of like I saw a story one time where a family was having plastic surgery done on their child with Down syndrome so he didn't oh, look my. that Down yeah. syndrome and I just made but me no, want to vomit. I, I mean, just... we love the uniqueness of oh, our kids. We, we love, love kids. what they're into. We we get into the same things too. Like They're quirky. They're funny. Yeah. They crack us up. A little girl in our class right uh -huh. now, she's a hot mess, but she makes us laugh and because she's yeah. quirky and the things she says and does but that's, so her, we that's don't, her personality exactly like we don't try to take those things away at all like we we love those things no and we do so. that's why i do what i do i love the you know i've like exactly. I said i've worked with special needs i did deaf ed i did work with all kinds of special mm -hmm. needs and i can't imagine doing anything else than what i do right now i love yep. it and but part of it too is that i get to really connect with these families as a whole by going in their home and I still have contact with all my families that have left this program. I still talk to them on a regular, I make them wait to be Facebook friends until they're out of the program and some things like that be just because of the, you know, the professional side of it. But I still talk to all of them. They all still send me pictures. They all tell, still, some of them I still go to their IP meetings with them as a support. Yeah, we don't want to assimilate them to mm -hmm. being a different person or somebody else, but to be able to function around everybody I mean, my and for everybody else to recognize them as a unique individual yeah. and to be okay with them and as well. And fun and funny mm -hmm. and different. And Which and our kids in the classrooms get that because they get to see our kids and see. They've grown up with it. They've had uh -huh. them since they were 
one and two years old in their classrooms with them, so they don't know any different, you know? They're not like, oh, he's weird, I don't want to play with him. They're like, oh, he laughs, I like it when... And some of them are like, I know he can't talk, but I like to read books with him and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. I mean, that's what we want to see. We just want them to be a functioning part of society. Yeah. They don't have to be normal. That's why I always say normal and typical, because who is normal and who is typical? Right. None of us are, you know? Like I said, my daughter is not on the spectrum, but she's definitely a little quirky and crazy and mm -hmm. you know that's her and that's even though sometimes i want to that's still her personality and i wouldn't change that and people same way about me they're probably a somebody that not everybody <laughs> you know but that's all of us and we're all different we all have our quirks and we all have our differences and that's just what makes us us so right, and we've talked about the whole 40 hours thing and maybe that not necessarily being like sitting down through yeah. all that um i've seen uh like one site say like oh no no one would ever suggest that you know that's only like maybe 10 hours a week like yeah. why would they still that? always be something <laughs> and then you know on the other side we have people saying well reach it research says you know uh, someone said 40 hours a week for every week for two years straight and like that's <laughs> so I'm seeing like this really broad range mm -hmm. um, and I'm hearing from parents at least the 40 hour being kind of like that standard uh, do you feel that that is in general the ABA feels that's a standard or no? I don't think so as much anymore from what I know of and families. I just I think lots of people just realize that that's not realistic in your daily life. You still have to have, you know, but I mean, I'm sure there's still people out there that do think that, but I just don't know how it's possible, really. Uh -huh. I mean, even though you can still say you're still doing it during bedtime and bath time and all that kind of stuff, even doing all that, I don't know that you could still have to live and you still probably have other kids and a husband and a job and you know everything else so I, I'm hoping that maybe that what we're seeing is that they're realizing it doesn't have to necessarily be yeah but there's, I mean there's not just you know DTT there's natural environment teaching and oh, yeah there's all um so yeah we're up and we're playing and we're still working on things so it's not necessarily strict like you know maybe but we're still doing it and working on those skills mm -hmm. but during their like I said during playtime during snack time during yeah you know during snack time we're having them working on the programs they're already working on weight and pointing and communicating and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff so you know but stuff you would do with any other kid that's even just a little language delay you're not gonna give them all the goldfish they want at a time you're gonna give them one at a time so they have to keep asking and communicating to get that i yeah. mean you have to provide those opportunities um, and do you all practice like incidental teaching um and do because i know i've noticed there's like maybe two different ways of going about it i've seen like okay well they're interested in something um we'll be like oh what's this or what do you call that um, and I've also seen it where they wait for them to maybe pick up a toy or something and then they'll take the toy and say, you know, like, what is this? And won't give it back to them until they do that. Um, I think ours is probably more the first. We have uh -huh. a naturalistic teaching kind of thing. And so we will, especially during that free play time that they have, we're going to kind of follow their lead and then build, use that as an opportunity. Oh, we're talking about whether we're working on imitation mm -hmm. skills or whether we're working on play skills or language skills we can do all that in there yeah. we can say oh my horse is jumping that, have your horse jump yeah you I did know, that or, today with my kid he's playing with a bunch of legos and we're supposed to be working on yes no so do you want the yoda lego do you want the horse is this a frog is this you know whatever and and he's pl the whole time he's just playing yeah <laughs> doesn't realize he's working i didn't take <laughs> anything you know like yeah and he's one like that that mm -hmm. we have to kind of Sneak it in there sometimes. Yeah. So you and he was still like, yes, no, no. no he just was yes. going along and yeah. doing great. You know, so. <laughs> Working, but we're playing. So, yeah. Definitely incidental, but mm -hmm. kind of following their lead. And I'm not going to go up and they go to play something and snatch it away and be like, tell me what this is. Are you not aiming? Yeah. yeah. I think you're, that's where you're going to get some not, bad reactions. Yeah. And they're going to be like, well, screw it. We don't want to play that. <laughs> I don't want to. It's <laughs> too much work. I'm going to go over here, you know. <laughs> I have seen um, where to. Um, so basically someone had sent a camera in with their child and like the workers were recording it so they knew you know but it was just with their child and um, they kind of did that but like it was like they saw them play with the toy so then they took the toy and said first we're gonna do this 
Um, how do you feel about that kind of thing? Because it wasn't like even with the toy specifically, it was like waiting for them to pick up something they're interested mm -hmm. instead of maybe already knowing like the reinforcers. Um, they're kind of figuring out what reinforcers. I mean, I would wait. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, we do that more of a setting where we're sitting and we have something and then we're going to bring something else out and kind of see which one they go towards more, or whether mm -hmm. they didn't go for it at all. Um, now, it's a different situation, like if they went to play with something, but we're needing to do our play program, then we're not going to necessarily, like, like I said, not snatch it right or anything else. We're like, first, oh, then. let's do first, first let's do the playhouse, and then we can do this, and we can have that as a visual. Um, and, like, and like when when you said we see their interest in something at playtime, like, oh, do you want to bring that to the table? Bring it to the table. Okay, we're going to set it here. Let's do this. Now we can play with it, kind of like a give and take. We try to make everything as child friendly, child led, and as easy going kind of mm -hmm. as, as we can to an extent, obviously. And, and, and be less of them. less of the like you have this. I'm going to take it, ask a question, but like we will we will put preferred items like up high sometimes just so that they have, so to, that they have to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's it's already up there, and then right. they have to point or ask or whatever. So that the, we're given them more opportunities to communicate. Yeah. I know what I was going to earlier. We have a little guy that pretty much all he does is stack, and he can stack, let me tell you, he can stack just about everything. And that's what he wants to do. He wants to go over and stack the books. So what we'll do is we'll go over and try to interrupt that play a little bit and just show him how to look at books or anything else. But then we're going to let him do that too because that's what he wants out of it. It may not be the most appropriate, but he's not hurting anything. It's still, as long as he can, we can teach him to do other things like let's actually look at the book, let's talk about the book. Okay, now you can stack to him or whatever else. We're still, you know, because that's comforting for him mm -hmm. and that's, you know, what he needs. But we're going to show him that there are other ways to do things with books besides just stacking them. I mean, he can stack, he, he'll get hold of mom's laundry and stack it and just makes him go from one pile to the other. He can stack, we have little pom-poms in our room. And so we'll kind of interrupt that every once in a while, show him some things to do. And sometimes he'll get mad, especially if somebody, like one of the little kids comes and gets one of the books that's supposed to go in the stack, you know, that makes him angry, but we show him, you know, hey, you can still do this or. both are addressed in our situation mm -hmm. at least in our classroom and behaviors aren't necessarily addressed unless they're really negative behaviors or mm -hmm. interfering with other things yeah but we talk about say. emotion we teach emotions we oh, talk yeah. about emotions you're ma you're mad that this happened and even when they're having a tantrum like, i understand that you're mad uh -huh. and that makes me you know and mm -hmm. I under, you know, I understand that that would make you mad that you had to stop playing with that toy, but we'll do this. And when then, you're mad, you can do this. When you're sad, you can do this. Like, yeah. So we do, know. we teach emotions. Or even that, when, you know, they throw one, I'm like, that makes me sad that you're throwing my toys or breaking my toys or, you know, different things like that. Or so. if a, they've hit a friend. Yeah. Look, your friend is sad. That yeah. hurts your friend when you, you know, when you hit them or vice versa. Yeah. That, that does make you sad when somebody hits you, you know, like we talk about emotions a lot yeah, I would say. I'd say we kind of address mm -hmm. like I said here we address it all yeah. but and behaviors really unless it's a, a, a negative true negative behavior or something that's interfering with something we probably I mean, that's the only time we really jump in and like I said we can't bite our friends we can't hit our friends we can't <laughs> yeah. break toys we can't you know <laughs> right. I would say that's him but I mean there's other times you know if they don't want to look at us, we're not going to make them look at us. You know, mm -hmm. if they're having a time when they're playing and stuff, we can still sit there and play and they don't have to necessarily look at us because I know that can be stressful for them. And, but as far as attention, as far as paying attention and learning, and I wouldn't say we necessarily demand I, it. The, it, demand, it, yeah. the word demand is. <laughs> so I'm like, we want to shape it and we want to teach them to do it and we want to motivate them to do yeah, it. But so that I don't they can think learn we it. demand. I, yeah, like I'm not going to say, mm -hmm. look at me, look at me, look at me. I mean, no, no, no. That, that person's going to be like, ah, no. I don't know. want to look. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, um, and then vice versa, like we want to give them lots of positive attention. Um, in appropriate ways yeah. so i mean i when i'm with a kid i'm following them around everywhere i'm interacting with them i'm playing with them i'm you know because we want to show them that they can that get, they can get attention in in these ways yeah because we want to reinforce the positive and so to show them that that's much easier than and we do that i mean that's mm -hmm. positive behavior support that's like i said i did that training for the whole center as a whole to work with any kind of kiddo is that you know kids are going to get your attention any way they can and if that's negatively, then it's going to be negatively. And so that you have to make sure then that there's other times you're showing them attention so that they don't feel like they have to do something negative to get your attention. So I've seen where with um, maybe older 
considered lower functioning, um, where they are kind of getting into like a lot of trouble or whatnot. Um, I heard them say, well, we need some compliance right now, and would have them sit there and they would maybe sign or whatnot for what they wanted or what they wanted to do. Um, they did acknowledge, like, you know, that's what you're saying, but no, you're going to sit here. Um, like, what are your thoughts on that kind of thing? Yeah, I'm not on board with that. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. I haven't done anything like that mm -hmm. here, so... Um, even when we're trying to get them to work, I'm not going to physically restrain them in that chair or anything else like that or or do something that doesn't make sense like yeah. why why are we having to sit here there's no point yeah like i mean yeah. i understand i'm in gymnastics and i need you to sit here in gymnastics but not just for that purpose of i need some compliance right. so we're yeah. going to do this right now yeah but basically because no. i said so like we, basically what it's we want everything to be functional and have a purpose and a reason yeah. and we're sitting here because all the other kids are sitting here and that's what our class is doing or mm -hmm. you know yeah paying attention to what we're going to be doing after we sit here and then we're going to be left to go yeah. do whatever but we need to learn no we're not doing mm -mm. <laughs> no, we're not. gotcha yeah and i think that is a lot of like a lot of people's concern mm -hmm. um it's almost like teach the skill for the skill's sake for like you're gonna sit gotcha. you're gonna sit you're gonna sit but like why yeah sitting? why you know, like what's why the point? is usually uh -huh. not addressed mm -hmm. you know maybe seems to not be addressed yeah. no. <laughs> mm -hmm. no we're always our I mean, programs and goals and everything else are led by them not by what we want to see or what our data says or what now, our data doesn't decide what we're doing our data just tells us how it's going and if we see we're gonna assume like when a kiddo's doing and we because we graph everything so that we can have a visual of their data we take data on everything they do and so if we're seeing that they're sticking it around that 40 to 50 percent you know they're not getting up here and they're not down here instead of us saying well what's wrong with that kid why aren't they learning that our approach is that what are we doing wrong that that kid's not learning that we need what can we something. change to help them and generally if it's sticking around that 40 percent 50 percent it's reinforcement whether that be whatever they're not getting anything out of it. And so we want to make sure. So that's our, I mean, yeah, the approach here is that. I would that, say it's pretty child-led in that sense. And, um, and that, you know, it's not, we're not going to say, what's wrong with this kid? Why are they not moving along? What, we're going to, we're going to wonder what's, what, what are we doing wrong? Why aren't they learning that? What can we do to change? I don't think that's yeah a global thought. So these but. would be the programs that we would not be on board with. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. Yeah. So like when I see, like if we're doing gross motor imitation and he's getting this and he's getting this, but he's not getting this, I'm not going to keep doing this for months on end because who cares whether he can do this or not? It's whether he can. And so I'm going to change it to a different skill. It may simply be moving it up to this and they get it and we move on mm -hmm. because who cares whether he can tap his legs? It's whether he sees me doing this and he can imitate it. And yeah. so I can change out those things, but there's some places that will do it and do it mass trying and do it over and over and over and you know that kids like and we do feel like there's some of our kids that to move on from one set to the other they have to have 90 to 100 percent independent and we'll see them get it one day and then you can almost tell some of our kids are like we did this already why are you still making me do this you know in their head sometimes and so but you have to get that two days in a row and you know they can do it and it's hard because you know they got 99 percent this day and now they're getting like 30 percent because they're just like over it but that's the hard part too. So we're gonna switch it up and see what we can do to make, make it more, it fun, more fun or whatever else. <laughs> Cause it's not whether, I mean, we can work on the same, it's not whether we care, you know, some kids may be on some of the same programs for a long time. Some of our kids, I may run out of programs by the time they leave us because they're doing so well. And, and then, you know, our programs run into everything from just like I said, trading and sharing, person, knowing their personal information. I mean, we have very high level, so we can do kind of all levels of kiddos and stuff, but, um, you know, we even get into, you know, one of our little guys when we knew it was time for him to move on to a regular program is when he's like giving me the wrong answer on purpose and laughing because he thinks it's funny. You know, when they have that level of thinking and humor, it's probably time for them to move on. They're good. <laughs> and he went on to regular pre-K, a regular kindergarten. Now he's getting ready to go first grade. Can we see? Yep. So, and doing great. I say both. Yeah, really, I think both. Um, we we want both of their lives to be easier, mm -hmm. and both of them for the child to be able to, like I said, 
be in society and interact and be able to live life. But then the family also has to be able to do, you know, especially if they have other siblings and stuff. That's when it gets hard. You know, the family I talked about with the two suckers, a lot of times what ended up happening, dad would take the three typical kiddos and they would go do fun things. And mom was always home with this guy because, Mm -hmm. and that's sad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's sad that you couldn't be a family unit and go, you know, they went all the way to Florida and went to Disney and mom was in the hotel with him, with him most of the time while the rest of the family's out. Hanging out, and that's that's hard. So, so the goal is ultimately to help both sides. Both sides, yeah. And that's and that's what well, our program is going to be more that than anything because yeah. I do go into the homes and do the home visits mm-hmm. and everything else. And even with early intervention, that's part of it is that they go into the homes and they're not only doing therapy with that yeah. kiddo, but they're teaching the family how that ongoing. And so that so we like serve the, the mom family as who a said, whole. I want to be able to take him to birthday parties, but we can't. What can we do? You know. So. So yeah, I definitely say both. Mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, I don't think you can say ABA is the best or ABA is this way or ABA is that way because it is going to look different at different places. And I realize that our program is very unique mm-hmm. in the ABA world and, and things like that. But um, of course, I feel very strongly about our program and our mm-hmm. kiddos and things like that. And but I've definitely seen the benefit in it. But I also believe you know we're we're there for that kid and we want to see that kid. Be independent and succeed and be unique, you know. Um, so, yeah, a lot of the concerns I think that you mentioned, um, we don't want that either. Um, I mean, they're very valid and, I, and I, we get it. And and I'm definitely sure there are people out there who do those things. Um, yeah. And that would be terrible. So, yeah, we're not on board with that. Um, and, and like I said a hundred times, you know, the, the DARS is very different than what you'd see at some of the places. But although I do think most places, I mean, like where you came from, I mean, I think it's definitely changed a lot for the better. More kid, kid-centric. kid Yeah. Do you like reset. That? Yeah, I mean, when they come in, maybe not sitting, maybe screaming, maybe... Um, well, I'd say not one, not one main one's little guy you saw in there the other day has changed dramatically. I mean, mm-hmm. he's... It's like he had kind of an awakening at some point, you know, and so that was nice to see. And, and For me, it always gets me when they're doing classroom activities and they're doing what the other kids are doing. And it just solidifies, you know, this is why we have worked on all these skills. Now they're seeing what their peers are doing. They're doing what their peers are doing. They're functioning in that environment. And I mean, that's. That's amazing. Even to if me. they're still flapping or spinning, yeah. or whatever else, they're still there <laughs> talking they're about some subject. Random, you know, so you know, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like to me, that's that's the end goal, and that's why we do what we do. And 